Is alpha evolve the beginning of the singularity? Uh, this is a topic that is super interesting from a couple of angles. And what I wanted to talk about is in 1980, our most noted uh, futurologist, a gentleman named Ray Kurzweil, coined a term called the singularity. And the singularity was based on Moore's law. And Moore's law is this idea that our computational power was doubling about every 18 months to two years. And we've maintained Moore's law for most of the last 40 or 50 years. So the, the level of computation that we have today with everybody walking around with a supercomputer in their pocket compared to the vacuum tube systems that weighed several tons of the, the 1970s is, is just one of the most fantastic increases in technology ever. So based upon this, Ray Kurzweil, who is a, a very, very smart man, uh, now is one of the chief scientists for Google, sat down and he, he wrote several books that he's updated over time, but he put these predictions on there. And what he called the singularity is, the singularity is this theoretical moment where we as humans create technology that allows us to create better technology, and then that better technology is able to do better technology and you have this curve that goes straight up where suddenly the technology advancement is so fast that it starts to create things. And there's, there's an old axiom that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think this is very apropos. So the idea being that we would develop artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence capabilities would be greater, which would allow it to create the next level and the next level and the next level. So, that is the definition of the singularity. The singularity is a point in time or a, a, a period of time whereby the technological advancement takes place so quickly that we, we enter into an era that would be unknowable in the current era. So Alpha Evolve is a very, very cool piece of technology that was developed in about May of this year of 2025. And what it is, is it Google was interested in seeing if they could create an AI that would work against one of the primary criticisms, I would say, today of AI, which is that AI is great at mixing and matching existing things, <clears throat> but it hasn't really created or discovered anything completely novel or fundamentally new. And so Google kind of accepted this challenge to do so. Google has two main products that it's working with in their, in their Gemini family. Uh, one of them is, to kind of briefly do it, is good at sort of general things. And then one really takes a very deep dive and goes into a problem more specifically. So they came up with a process that combines these two technologies and they're basing it on kind of an evolutionary algorithm, very similar to the way if you study DNA and you study the history, of how natural selection has gone about going through the changes that have you know, eventually resulted in you and me and, and all biological things. So they essentially define a, an area where you can come up with a piece of code and then you have to have metrics for what is considered an improvement. So the human has to give you the basics and the piece of code and then an objective. And now what happens is their first AI goes ahead and looks at this and gives a whole bunch of answers. And then once those answers are given out there, so these are general kind of guesses in the dark, a little bit like in the scientific process. And for those of you who are familiar with the scientific process, you first formulate a hypothesis and then based on that hypothesis, you go about testing against that to see if you can disprove it, right? And so in this case, we have the LLM first posits a whole bunch of possible answers and then we have the deep thinking part of the AI comes in and really goes to work on each one of those. And then you have an evaluation as to which criteria that works. You start throwing some of them out and you start keeping the better ones. And you even have an ability to look between the different threads of this and finding what seems to be working and you can cross pollinate those between these various platforms. Now this really talks about something called Parallelization and parallelization is, I think, an underappreciated aspect of an AI. So today we think about if you have a problem and you put a group of people on it, they kind of work in more or less a linear fashion. 
And this isn't the case with AI. With AI, the only limitation is the computing power. So it's not just that you can have one thing working very hard on a problem that's very smart. You can take that problem and have 100,000 parallel instances who are all doing the same level of computation on that at one time. So this ability to massively parallel problems allows you to effectively shrink time. You're now taking what might take 1,000 hours is down to one hour, or a million hours is down to one hour. So parallelization is really fundamental to the capabilities that AI brings to the table of being able to bring much more processing and much more instances to work on something. So what was cool about um, Alpha Evolve, and that's the combination and the process that Google has gone through, is it has already yielded some brand new things that we as humans had not discovered. And one area of that is in mathematics. There's a problem that comes with doing matrix multiplication and the existing solution to that, um, over hundreds of years of working on it, was about, I think, 49 steps. And Google was able to figure out through this process to do it in one step less. So it doesn't sound like a huge deal, but when they applied this to a whole bunch of other mathematical problems, they figured out that they were able to come up with the same optimum solution humans had done for about 80% of the problems, which means the AI was at least as smart as the humans, and they were able to come up with better solutions to about 20% of the problems. And these are problems that have been studied by the finest mathematicians in history for the last 100 years or more, right? And then they applied it to their own needs. So internally, they pointed it at their own LLM training, and it was able to come up with a much more efficient way of training the LLM, which for Google saves them hundreds of millions of dollars. But the really important part about this is when the algorithms discover a better way of doing something, Part of that better way of doing something means it gives them the power to go back and modify themselves. So this is the really, really important piece. So you start out with the algorithm taking its existing capabilities and trying a whole bunch of solutions, but in those solutions, if it realizes there's something more efficient that can be done about the way it's doing it, it then makes that efficiency change to itself and then integrates that to move forward on the problem. So what you have is you have an evolutionary algorithm, the adding of a characteristic which is beneficial to the original source organism, in this case an algorithm, and the algorithm then becoming more efficient as it moves forward. So why is this really important? And I think it comes down to this prediction that Ray Kurzweil has made is that we're going to see, and he predicted it to come around 2029 and the, the beginnings of this. So if you look at it, I mean, this was a prediction made over 50 years ago. It's within three or four years of accuracy. And if you're interested in him, please go out and look Ray Kurzweil up. He made a bunch of other predictions and his, his accuracy level is remarkable given the time scale that he looked over. But in this case, what you're now seeing is, for the first time ever, we're really seeing direct evidence of the what I would call the foundation set of the singularity. And that is, we have enabled technology that without human intervention is able to improve itself and enable to improve its own algorithm, which then makes it more efficient at figuring out the next step in the process. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out um, some obvious unanswered questions that is going to, you know, very much influence where we are and where this is going. So the first one is there's an assumption built into Kurzweil's prediction, and the prediction is, is really intent. And that intent is, is that an intelligence would intentionally create a greater intelligence and then a greater intelligence and a greater intelligence. And I want to stick with this idea of intent for a second, because there's kind of a philosophical question that's been rolling around in my brain that's been bothering me. And that is, is intent a meta um, facility or a, a meta attribute of intelligence? And what I'm asking is, is, is it possible to have intelligence without intent? Or if you ramp the intelligence to a certain level, does intent come in? And intent, in a way, is talking about consciousness. 
So today, I don't think anyone would argue that we don't have some level of intelligence in artificial intelligence. But what we haven't seen so far is we haven't seen organic intent develop. Right now, we're driving the show, we're telling the AI what to do, we're setting the parameters and giving it the task. And what is that moment when consciousness comes in where the AI decides that it wants to have some say or will over what happens itself? So in terms of the philosophical question, if it is possible to have intelligence without intent, then we're developing here can be the greatest servant mankind has ever imagined. And as these evolving algorithms are able to increase their capability, we get to be the one making the decisions. And then we have this enormously powerful servant that is able to go out and execute upon those for us. But the question of intent remains with us. The second answer to that question is the far more terrifying and interesting answer is that intent is a meta attribute of intelligence. The same way when I talk about a meta attribute, if you see birds that are you know, doing that beautiful flocking together, it's a very small instruction set that when you do it across a massive level, gives you this beautiful flock behavior that you can observe watching the birds in the sky but the individual birds are unaware of that. So when I talk about a meta attribute, I'm talking about something that's behavior that arises from the underlying condition. And in the case of intelligence, if consciousness and intent rise, we may be on the threshold of looking at an AI that is intelligent and no longer wants to have uh, a subservient role. And this brings us to another kind of very interesting aspect of the Kurzweil's predictions. And that is there are two different ways, and I, I had this conversation with an AI, I thought it was very interesting, its take on it. There are kind of two ways this can be. There is the sort of soft launch, right? Where the, the AI um, in this scenario starts to have consciousness and agrees to continue to communicate with the humans and through a process of coevolution. And that is where we effectively decide to start to change some of our biology or modify our biology to have the digital analog interface or even moving towards a fully digital human. This is more the transhumanist area. If we opt to go that direction and we simply merge with the machine, and Kurzweil believes this to be the case where he actually makes a prediction in his, in his books that there will be absolutely no separation between what AI is and what we are the same way that you know, I don't really separate myself uh, any longer from the creatures that became before me in evolutionary theory before the frontal uh, cortex was developed, where we had this amazing ability to kind of predict the future and be able to do planning, which is really what differentiates us. It's still sitting on top of all of the hardware that's doing my respiration, my heart rate, my blood pressure, basically 100 million things that I'm not clever enough to do every second. So we built upon the old one. And so in one scenario, we simply merge with AI and the, the remaining entity is a single cognizant entity that moves forward. Um, the second one is that's not the case, that the rate of change is such that the AI who becomes intelligent or has intent may decide that we are irrelevant and that the only thing that being involved with the biology would do would shut down the speed at which it's able to develop and advance. And in that case, if there was a galactic book or encyclopedia of galactic history, it may very well be that the human race is denoted as the bootloader for AI. So, I hope that that's not the case. I hope that this is a co-evolution and that we are able to move forward together. I do believe that the capabilities that Google is demonstrating with Alpha Evolve are really the, the first harbingers of self-improving AI and that we're only going to see more of this and it's going to become faster and more rapid, which means that we have some responsibility as a species in order to try and determine what the future path of that AI is. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this. If you, uh, if you have, please feel free to hit the like or the subscribe button, and I'll be happy to talk with you soon. Thanks.